Okay, start out. What kind, what type of problems do we need to use the alignment chart on? You have to have a moment connection. You have to have a moment connection. You don't necessarily have to, but that's what we usually use it on, right? Moment connections. So we need some kind of connection between our column and our beam. Right? Something like... Like that, right? And we would find an equivalent, it helps us find equivalent Ks, right? Helps us take something like this and it breaks it up into two different columns. Well, that's the old way to learn it. Um, one way to think about it that isn't exactly right, but one way to think about it is that we have an equivalent column in the top and then have an equivalent column in the bottom. What are these little swooshy things? Rotational springs. Squishy things, aka rotational springs. That's right. They're taking all of this stiffness and slamming it together into one rotational spring. All this stiffness, all this stiffness. That's what they're for. Great. So what's what's the equation for G? Because we use we need a G top and a G bottom. We go on the alignment chart. We have to decide if it's sway or no sway. But then the G equation doesn't change whether it's sway or no sway. It's the same. What's the equation for G? Sum of I over L of the column. Sum of I over L of the beam. And that's right. Well, that's the first version of the equation. And we're going to change this equation. We're going to add, what's the first correction factor we added? Tau. The tau factor. Where does it go? The top. So then our equation changed to tau times I over L of the column over I over L of the beam. Right? What's the tau factor? What is it correct? Modulus. Modulus. That's right. Corrects the modulus, the assumption, one of the assumptions in the alignment chart, that the stiffness of the beam and columns are the same. Right? What stiffness is being reduced? What stiffness is decreasing? The beam or the column? Okay, let me ask a question a different way. What do we use to find tau? P over A. You take P over A and you get some stress. If P over A is high, what's tau factor? High or low? Low. P over A is low, tau factor is high. What's high for a tau factor? What's the largest that tau factor can be? One. No correction. And that happens when P is low. Actually happens when P over A is less than 0.44 times FY. When P over A is less than 0.44 times FY, tau is equal to 1. When it's greater than 0.44, it's less than 1. And how do we find it? It's in the steel manual. Table 421 in the steel manual. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Um, so it goes up there. That's right. So it reduces the column. Okay, so what's the M factor? What's that all about? What is it correct? 
of the column or the beam? The beam. The M factor is a correction for the rotational stiffness of the beam. It's actually, it is the actual rotational stiffness divided by the ideal rotational stiffness. Yeah? Okay. So ideal rotational stiffness. What were the two assumptions? One was 6 EI over L. What was that for? For sway. And the other one was 2 EI over L. And it's for non-sway. Is this in your notes? Yes, it is. Great. So the, so the bottom's going to be either six or two, depending on what what the column is, if it's sway or no sway. And what's the top going to be equal to? Nine. A hundred, two billion, no, right? Something out of this table, right? Something out of this table. You're going to have to look at your structure. And if you haven't done this before, then it takes practice. We did this together down here. A lot of some example problems. We'll do, if you have more on your homework, there'll be, they'll, there will be a chunk on the final exam. The final exam will cover, have a much more emphasis on columns and bracing design and it will um, but it will be comprehensive okay we'll cover every topic and usually if there's a topic I didn't ask on a previous exam it's probably a good topic for the final exam or if there's a call, topic you didn't do well it's a great topic for the final exam um, let's see so you draw your deflected shape. You look at your deflected shape and you pick out from it which one of these apply. Okay? And then you use that in your um, M factor. And that goes in the numerator. Okay, great. So how does that change our G? Where does the M factor go? In the bottom. Summation of tau I over L of the column all over summation I of M I over L of the beam. You with me? Okay, so we'd seen that. Talked about that in class. And then we got down to this assumption that the there were no axial load, there is no axial load in a restraining member. Remember us talking about that? There's no axial load in a restraining member. And we used to say that's a good assumption, and now we're starting to say that's not so good an assumption. And just to review what that's about, if I look at this structure, and I just think about buckling, okay? let's say buckling is the only failure mode that can happen. then what does structural resiliency tell me is going to happen? What does structural resiliency say again? So you said yield. We're going to say reach limit state. The load is going to be able to increase on a structure until um, every member in the structure reaches its limit state, right? Or, if one member gets so overloaded it fails as an individual, right? <clears throat> and when, when we do that fail as an individual check, it's almost assuming as if the column is acting like a pin-pin column. Okay. And we'll talk more about that coming up. But if we st apply structural resiliency to this frame, it says 
that we can truly only have one column. It's a bit, whoa, 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 whoa. We have two columns. We have a column here and we have a column here. That was a crutch that we used in the past to so I could get through with columns and talk about something else, okay? Or you you maybe it's stopping point in the past. But that's not exactly right. It's not exactly right. It's not wrong, but it's not exactly right. To work the problem correctly, you truly only have one column. There's only truly one member that wants to fail. And what do the other members try to do? Stop it. So, for example, let's just assume the bottom member is the, the column. Okay? Okay? So that means it wants to buckle. That means this member is going to try to help it, right? And that means this member is going to try to help it, isn't it? Isn't it? It's going to try to help, isn't it? <clears throat> and in the past, we had this summation up here. And we're going to lose that summation. I'm not going to have it anymore. This is the final correction, or one of the final corrections to the alignment chart. It's just going to be tau. There's only one column. Only one. And instead of calling them a beam, we're going to call them a restraining member. So this member now would become a a restraining member. We talked about this before. This member is going to become a restraining member. It's going to try to help. And instead of including it in the numerator, we're not going to do that anymore. Now it's going to be included in the denominator. So you would in a sense have two restraining members for this failure. But we have to take into account that in this restraining member, aka beam, there's axial load. And that axial load, if it's high enough, will reduce our stiffness. You with me? If that's weird to you, think about the tau factor. It's real similar to the tau factor. Similar concept. We use different math. But it's a similar concept to the tau factor. As the load gets higher and higher and higher in this member, because of residual stresses and also just because we're getting closer and closer to the buckling load, we don't have the same stiffness as we would if it was on its side and there was no load in it. Does that make sense? Hmm. Some people just need to see some math. Okay. So we're going to figure out that the bottom is now going to say summation M I over L times, I think it's 1 minus P over P critical. Let me look it up and see what it, oh, sigma over, over sigma critical. It's the same because the area, area is the same, right? So we're going to say th this goes here, 1 minus sigma actual stress over the critical stress. Or it could be, you'll see me use P over P critical as well. The only difference is the area and the areas cancel. Okay. <coughs> And that will be our final version of the G. It's going to look something like that. So it's nothing but a G thing from here out. So is there any questions? Is there any questions about what I just talked about? If you're to work this, the reason why people do this is because to solve this problem exactly is a very complicated differential equation. And when you solve it exactly, what you'll find is that actually this beam contributes 
this contributes, and actually this also will contribute, because this will give some extra stiffness to the column, which is able to give some extra stiffness to this column. But there will only be one member that tries to buckle, and everything else will try to restrain it. But one reason why we don't take this into account in the alignment chart is because it's not a large contribution at all. And since it's not a large contribution, people haven't worked out all the math. Okay? But you can get within about 10% of the actual differential equation answer with this trick to the alignment chart. Okay? And it takes you like two lines if you know how to do it. Okay? And to work the differential equation takes like 10 pages if you know how to do it. Okay? So. It's, build, it's getting closer and closer and closer to a more accurate answer is what, it, is, what it is, is what you're doing. Okay? Okay. So, let's go back to the notes we talked about last time. And really hit this concept again. We talked about this impact of axial load on restraint. This is exactly where I explained that in a sense, it doesn't matter about orientation. We have one member that's the buckling member and we have another member that's the restraining member. One of the hardest problems in some of these, one of the hardest things in some of these problems is to figure out which member is the buckling member. Sometimes you have to guess. Sometimes you have to say, well, I don't know. I'm going to assume this is the buckling member and work the problem. And then I don't know. I'm going to assume this member is the buckling member and solve the problem and figure out you're going to get two different loads, two different capacities. And which one are you going to use? The lower one, right? The lower one's going to control. Okay? It's kind of obvious in this one which one which one's going to be which. One of them is L and one of them is 0.8L. The larger the KL over R, the lower the capacity is going to be. Because this L is longer pretty obvious that this member is going to be the buckling member and this member is going to be the restraining member. Does that make sense? That's when you have to guess. That's when you'd have to say, you'd have to work the problem once where you assume this was the column. Then you'd have to work the problem again where you'd assume this was the column and you'd compare your answers and you would pick the one that required the lowest amount of load. Does that make sense? So, to take this into account, we reduce our rotational stiffness by one minus sigma over sigma critical. And I say right here, this isn't exactly right, but it is conservative. Um, we made a plot of sigma over sigma critical and we did a ratio of the bending stiffness with P over the bending stiffness without P. It's actually a nonlinear it's a nonlinear curve. Okay? It's a nonlinear curve. And the the shape of the curve really depends on um, the type of cross section. Sometimes it's um, it's fatter at the top and then levels off. Sometimes it's fatter over here and then levels off. Sometimes it's about in the middle. People don't, you know, at this point though, when you're using this, you don't even know sometimes which section you'll be using. Sometimes you have to do design, right? Oftentimes we have to do design. So you have no clue what section you're going to be using. So what people did instead is, is they said, you know what? Instead of having all these curves to deal with, we're just going to make it a straight line because it's conservative. It's always conservative. It's below every single curve. And it matches here and it matches there. So we're going to give up a little accuracy to make our math really easily. Easy. So note, this is the final, final, final version of the G. Okay? Tau times I over L of the column. Only one. Oh.
over summation of m times i over l times 1 minus sigma over sigma critical. This means that for these columns, you will now need an m factor. And you will need a 1 minus sigma over sigma critical factor for the columns. How about for a beam? Do you need this? A beam, if you have a member with a low axial load, if you wanted to, you could you could do this. If, if sigma is 0, this goes to 0, doesn't it? You just get 1. There's no correction factor for it. Does that make sense? Okay. The bad thing is that this, because if we have this and tau, it now makes analysis problems iterative. But design problems are exact. So when you're designing, it makes things really easy. When you're doing analysis, does this work? It makes things hard. Let me show you what I mean. That's it. It's, this is example coming up down here. We have this problem, a pin, a pin or a roller, a roller, and a pin with the axial load on it. It's a W10 by 45 and it's oriented like this. So I'm going to know right off the bat, one of these has to be a column and one of these has to be a beam or a restraining member. Which one's the column? Brilliant. The longer of the two, right? Really, we'd pick the one that we think would have the largest K over R. The Ks, we don't know. Right? The L's, this one's larger. The R's are the same. We're going to go with the longer one. Yeah? Yeah. Great. The bottom member has to be the column as it is longer. And the upper member is the beam or restraining member. Now, I'm going to go ahead and solve. I'm going to assume K equals 1. Just to get that bound. Because remember how we talked about the individual it cannot fail as an individual. That's what structural resiliency says. It can't fail as an individual. So this, is, this ensures, this, this tells me what my individual failure is. If it was going to fail as a pure pin-pin column. And then we're going to find out that that's not exactly right. That there's more capacity than that. This kind of bounds things. P critical is 210, or and this P critical is 306. This is an, another way to, another trick you could use if you're not for sure to get an idea or first guess of what's the column and what's the beam. Now, we know that we're going to be at least, we're going to be greater than 210, and we're going to be lower than 306. We know that. It's going to be greater than 210. It's going to be lower than 306, somewhere in the middle. So for giggles, I'm going to assume 300. And I'm going to check. So I'm going to say, I'm going to assume, I'm trying to figure out, again, I'm trying to figure out how much load this system can hold. I'm assuming P is going to be 300, and I'm going to check that assumption, OK? So I assume 300 kips. I check my P over A, and I get 22.5. My tau comes out to be a 0.94. Okay, looked it up in the in table 421. So my tau is 0.94. I have my I over L of my column. My I over L of my restraining member happens to be 80% of that. And so they're going to cancel, and this is just going to be 1 over 0.8. Does that make sense? If that freaks you out. Put the real I's in and the real L's in, and they'll cancel out. Okay, it'll all be okay. This 0.8 comes from 16 being 80% of 20. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. This is the same thing as 16 feet. This is the same thing as 20 feet. Not the L is 16, the 0.8L is 16. Okay? Okay, the I's are the same. Now, my M factor. Does this sway or no sway? No sway. 
Okay, so that means my I have a two. Now I draw my deflected shape. Right? This actually should probably come out and then go down. Something like that. Now I gotta pick out. I know my denominator is two, now I gotta find my numerator. And I say it's three. So we have a moment on one side and we have a pin on the other with no moment on it. That makes sense. Okay, so we get three. Now I have to do one minus P over P critical. Well, P, I, P, where's P from? That's what I assume. 300 kips, 306. My G bottom is infinity. My G top is 25.6. My K is 0.98. Therefore, my P critical comes down to be 210. What I assumed is not what I calculated. What's that mean? It's not right. So what do I do? Assume again. So now I pick 250. Do everything again. I get a tau 0.992. I'm just going to say that's 1. It's pretty close. So I plug in here. You can check this for yourself. You get a G top of 2.9, a G bottom of, of infinity, K of 0.94, a KL of 18.8, .8, a P critical is 233. It's pretty close, isn't it? So now I'm going to assume another one, 240. Do everything again. Tau is 1, 2.5, K of 0.93, KL of 18.6, 245. 240 is pretty close to 245. Now, how did I get, how do I know what to assume? I probably picked a pretty bad assumption to begin with on purpose because I wanted to show you what happens how you go wrong. It might not have been a bad idea to assume of the average between these two. So around 260-ish. So it probably would have been a better assumption. Okay, probably would have got you closer faster. But whatever you assume, when I get 210 and 300, it's probably good to assume the average between the two. Okay, which is about 250, it's in the ballpark of 250. So 250 and 233, assuming the average, that's around 240. It's pretty close to 240, maybe 240 and some change. And that would have, I think if you keep that, you, using that technique of assuming the average of your differences, then that will help you, help you hone in on what the right answer will be quickly. But hopefully, you'll, it'll only take a few iterations to get where you need to be. Does that make sense? So there's an example, there's a problem like this on your homework. When's it due? Friday.